Good morning, my name is Wiley Taylor. This is my partner, Brandon Lavalley, and we're here today to present you our project on the building design. So the project schedule for today proceeds as starting with project objective, then going to theory, design considerations, examination process, and then over to loading adjustments and finishing off with results and conclusion. So to start off, we got the project objective. The building had to have had to be able to resist all loadings through all 12 floors, and we had to be able to determine the worst case scenario exterior and interior columns uh, when factory loadings are applied. And then for the beam, we also had to do the worst case scenario beam, and it had to resist all on factory loadings and be able to obtain a deflection limit of L over 240. And then after all that was complete, we had to in increase the loading of 75% to all columns and beams within the building. Uh, next up is the theory of the building design. So the building had to be able to resist all vertical and axial loads for all the 12 stories that we designed it for. Uh, we had to use columns and beams to support all functionalities of the building. And then uh, we had to use tributary areas to account for the weights above each column. So say we had column A, it had its own weight around it or so on and so forth. And then uh, we had to make sure that stability of resistance was kept throughout the entirety of the building. So the design considerations for the project were laid out in the project guideline. A minimum floor area of 600 meters squared was required. A column with limited unscored length of five meters was required. A beam with unscored length of nine meters and it had to be at least 12 stories in height. So the examination process was in the order of operations in terms of the design. First off, we had to find the tributary areas and the critical loadings. With that, we were able to do the beam analysis. And then with those, we were able to do the factor loadings with the weights of the beams and the floor loads, live and dead loads. And then with those, we were able to do the column analysis with the factor loading. And lastly, we were able to do the loading adjustment by adding 75% onto those weights. So to find the tributary areas, you take the distance, half the distance between each column from both sides of it, and then you multiply those together to get the floor area. Our columns A, B, or A, D, M, and P were all similar in symmetry, so we only had to solve for one of those columns instead of the floor. As you can see here, B, C, N, and O were all the same. H, E, I, and L were the same. F, G, J, and K are all similar. Here is the calculations for the A, D, M, and P. So the width between A and B was 4.5 meters. The length between A and E was also 4.5 meters. So the area of loading that is applied to that column is 20.25 meters squared. So following the calculations of the tributary areas, critical loadings were then uh, calculated as well or defined from the building code specification. And we just chose a building of low risk office space. So we found that the live loads from the section 4.1.5.3 in the basement and floor received a 4.8 kPa. And then any floor above that would receive a live load of 2.4 KPA, and then it also stated that the roof live load would be 1.8 KPA, and then following those, we were given the wind and snow loads from an industry professional. The wind load was stated to be 2.08 KPA, and the snow load at 0.65 KPA. Uh, then to follow that up, we had to find the dead loads that we were going to use on each floor plus the roof. So uh, dead loads that worked within the roof and the floors. We used floor joists at 16 inch spacing. So we got a 0.16197 kilonewtons per meter squared for that attribute. And then seven eighths OBS plywood on the floors as well. Uh, 0.11974 kilonewtons per meter squared on that one. And then on the ceiling, we had five eighths gypsum board and it was 0 0.11064 kilonewtons per meter squared. And then the last one uh, only included on the floors, not the roof, would be marble tile at 0.15997 kilonewtons per meter squared. And then also note that 
only a specified portion of dead loads were used to keep the building design as close to basic as possible. Uh, beam analysis. So the worst case beam with an unsupported length of nine meters had to be used. And then it had to meet the limitation of L over 240. And to do this, we rearranged the moment of, like for the moment of inertia using the deflection equation. Once the deflection equation uh, or the moment of inertia was found, we then matched the moment of inertia to a functional beam from the sizing chart that can be seen in Appendix B in our report. So the beam calculations, we had to do the deflection equation first to see what the allowable deflection would be with the unsupported length of 9,500 9, 9, uh, millimeters. And then from this, we rearranged the equation to find the I value that we would need. So that equaled 418.622 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the fourth. And then from that, we matched it with the beam sizing chart right here, over there. And from that, we selected a functional beam size of W310 by 310 by 179. So to analyze a beam, you have to use the factor loadings. The factor loadings for the roof, we use the case three, which is 1.25 times the dead load plus 1.5 times the skull load plus 0.5 times the live load. We use this because you use it to get the greatest factored load, and since the snow load was greater than the live load for the ceiling, or for the roof, that's why we use that one. For each interior floor, we use case two, which is 1.25 times the dead load, plus 1.5 times the live load. This gave us a 4.29 kPa for the interior floors. And then for the axial loads of the wind, we used the 1.25 times dead load plus the 1.4 times the wind load. And since there's no dead load on the sides, it only is 1.5 times the wind load, which equals 0.9 kPa. So for the column analysis, this is where the factor loading in the trim area comes into play. All loadings need to be accounted for for the interior floor loads, the roof loads, and the axial loads. The loadings are multiplied by the designated trim area areas and the sum of all loadings is determined to be the result of load on the bottom floor. The bottom floor has the worst case scenario because it has the weight of all of them put together. So for the worst case scenario column, we chose column F because it had the largest trivia area. To find the loading applied onto the column F, it was the roof load plus the floor load times 11, because there's 11 floors above that, times the trivia area plus the weight of the I-beam per meter times the length needed for the area times the 12 floors that are above it. This gave us a load of 4639.79 kilonewtons. Then we input that into Euler's equation and rearrange to find an I value. The I value that we found was 58.73 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the 4th. We reference that over to our SHS column chart and we found that the SHS 250 by 6.3 column had an I value of 60.14 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the 4th. So we selected that one because it was just slightly above what was needed. To find the exterior column with the largest tributary area and the largest wind load, we used column B. To find the loads applied to it, it was the same as column F, which is the roof load plus the floor load times 11 times the tributary area plus the weight of the I-beams. With that, we got 2400 and 43.15 kilonewtons. That was then input into P over A equals 350 MPA, which is the yield for steel. Then that was rearranged to find the area needed to support that, which equal to 6,981 millimeters squared. Then we reference over to the chart to find an SHS 200 by 10 column that had an area greater than that, and that column had an area of 7490 millimeters squared. With that, we found the UDL for the wind factored loads times the width of the wall, which gave us a UDL of 8.645 kilonewtons per meter. With that, we were able to find the moment, which is equal to 5.403 kilonewtons times meters. Then we were able to input that into combined stresses, which is P over A plus MY over I. That gave us an MPA of 
338.32, which is below the yield of steel. Therefore, the column will be able to withstand the forces. Uh, the next step of the project was to add a loading alteration of a 75 increase or 75 percent increase on all loadings. So this impacted beam D by giving it a new loading of 54.689 newtons per millimeter, and that led to a new moment of inertia value of 732.647 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the 4. With the new moment of inertia value, the beam had to be altered to a, a scale size up, which gave us W310 by 310 by, one, or by 283. And then uh, because of this, off the beam sizing chart, the moment of inertia value for that selected beam was 786.80 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the fourth, which is just slightly bigger than the required moment of inertia. So continuing on with the loading increase of 75%, we now go, we turn to the interior column F. So it incurred a new loading increase of just above 8 million newtons. And then it had a moment of inertia switch to 102.234 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the fourth. And this finally led to a column alteration to the SHS uh, 250 by 12. And then flipping over to the in exterior column B, the same thing happened. The load increase went to just above 4 million newtons. And a new area value became uh, just above 12,000 millimeters to the fourth, or millimeters squared, sorry. And then, so then the column had to be switched for that one as well to, to comply with the 300, uh, 350 uh, yield strength of steel, so then that led to a, an SHS column of 220 by 16. Okay, and then uh, lastly, these are the recap results of what we just went through through the process of the project. So it covers the original beam and the loading adjusted beam for beam B, the adjustment and the original interior column for column F, and as well as the exterior column of the column B. B. And then to conclude, uh, we were able to construct a building that was able to resist all forces using beams and columns and we were able to show exactly how uh, certain beams within certain beams and two different columns within the structure resist these forces using factored and non-factored loadings and the beam is able to resist the limitation of L over 2, 240 to flare the references we used throughout our project and, uh, and through the presentation. Thank you for listening to our presentation today. I hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions, please email us at wileytaylor at 63 at gmail.com.